everything you know about the nitrifying bacteria cycle does not matter today. We are talking about black water aquariums and how to properly and safely set them up without killing all of your fish uh, and plants for that matter. So take everything you know and pretend that it's wrong or doesn't exist for now because we are about to enter a completely new realm that's actually pretty new to science as well as our hobby and that is the black water aquaria realm so welcome to the secret history living in your aquarium today we're going to be setting up a black water aquarium from an existing aquarium and that's just so that the water uh, doesn't crash. Uh, it's very easy when you set up an aquarium to just load it with leaves and botanicals and end up with essentially battery acid uh, for water. Um, one, you're going to shock the fish when you put it in and they may die. And two, no plants are going to grow there probably. So we're going to talk about how we can enter this thoughtfully and calculated and still have a really nice looking tank with lots of leaf litter, lots of cover, so that it can function as a colony breeding tank or a biotope, whatever you'd like, or even an aquascape. Uh, so let's talk about it, let's take a look at it, and let's get these tanks going. All right, everybody, so we're gonna be turning one of these tanks. This one into a black water biotope. Now, what does that mean? What what does what are the ramifications of doing this? So, first of all, we're going to get a feel for where things are. And, you know, in this tank, we've already got a species of fish that does very well in black water or uh low low uh, TDS and highly acidic water, and that is the Paradise gourami or the kissing gourami sometimes it's called these are an albino pair and they spawn for me regularly now this tank I'm assuming is probably around 6.8 or 7 uh, Our tap water here in Seattle comes out pretty much neutral which is uh, Advantageous for what we're going to talk about today and what we're going to try to do now to talk about a black water tank I want to show you that I have other tanks where we definitely have a whole bunch of leaves and tannins and things in there, but they're still growing plants. Now these tanks are in the 6.5 to 7 realm, and uh, they house species that can deal with uh, black water, such as these uh, uh, rainbow gouramis or uh, samurai gouramis, whatever you want to call them, they're uh, chocolate uh, valenti gouramis. Uh, as well as some of these pencil fish and pseudomagills uh, that can live in these rivers, streams, and uh, little side canals off, off rivers or lakes that are flooded marshes that basically flood the forest floor uh, during the rainy season. And then as the dry season starts to set in, the water gets lower and lower, the TDS Sometimes it raises, but other times it stays low. It kind of depends if water's flowing through. And so we need to talk about everything we know about cycling a tank and how that does not apply, essentially, when we're going to be looking at a true black water tank. So this tank here, we still have nitrobacillus or some of the other nitrifying bacteria. Um, nitrobacter uh, that grow on either the filter media and the surface area in the tanks and basically anytime water flows by that with nitrites there's a type of bacteria that takes ammonia and turns it into nitrites and then a type of bacteria that takes the nitrites turns it into nitrates nitrates are a lot less harmful for your fish obviously so uh, we can deal with those, we let those build up a bit, and then we do a water change to keep it in check. That's kind of the status quo of most aquarium chemistry that you're probably aware of at this point, unless you're already versed in uh, black water tanks, and in that case, then maybe you don't need this video. But when we talk about a black water tank, here's another species, by the way, that 
could be at home in this new tank. We're going to be trying to get to somewhere between the 5.5 and 6.5 pH range, ideally keeping it just above 6. That's the easiest to manage, and when you have a tank like that, you can actually still support some plants. So plants such as this Bulbitis hedulata, um, Anubius that's hardy, um, Java moss, uh, also Anubius like uh, Nana Petite or Barteri, various, uh, basically some of the, the, the plants that have sturdy leathery leaves uh, rather than really thin leaves or really fine needle leaves. Plants like hornwort or uh, other fine leaf plants will generally melt and fall apart in lower uh, in lower pH water. So in this tank here, they're hanging out in around 7.4 water, and uh, they're fine, they're happy, they're thriving. But if we take a look real quick at the tank where we've got Elisoma, oops, that around, Elisoma uh, species, as well as some uh, swamp guppies, we can see that the hornwort has lost all of its uh, needles, or, or basically it's not thriving, it's falling apart, as are some of the crypts and valcinaria are melting. Which, uh, side note, if you use uh, Flourish XL by Seachem, that can oftentimes melt your uh, cryptocurrins and your valcinaria uh, for the same reason, that they just don't thrive in that environment. So, what can we do to change the environment over to acidic without killing everything? Well, the first thing we need to do is, well, obviously we need to get baseline chemistry information from our tanks. And we're going to do that with just some basic test strips. So we're going to take a look at a few different tanks to kind of get an idea of you know where the different baselines are so we already have the te the test sitting over uh by the tank that is going to be transformed and i apologize the 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 camera lens may get a bit foggy here so bear with me and uh let me brush that off from time to time so that uh we can see what we're doing all right so we need to talk a little bit about how these environments evolved. So, first of all, when we look at black water, we know that historically, and we're talking on a geological uh, basis, that we had to have plants and wood, basically, um, moss, sphagnum moss, and things like that, to break down into acids in order to get that tannin rich water. So we have these ancient lakes and rivers and we had a, a period of time uh, around 300 million years ago where we start to see ferns and we start to see some of the extremophile plants um, growing more and more accustomed to the entire world. Also during this time, the oxygen level on Earth skyrockets. And that's why we see, during the Cambrian explosion, for instance, we see all sorts of insects and bugs that are six feet long centipedes and things like that that now can't be supported. And that's because bugs respirate through, uh, basically through the side of their body, through little pores, and they don't have to use lungs uh, to breathe in and out. But because of that, it has to diffuse throughout their body. So when we talk about fish, they've been around for, say, four or 500 million years in some form or another. And really 300 million years is when they become fish as we know them today uh, with the traits and, and biology we know them with today. Plants around the same time are also being found in the water. Algae's been in the water for a long time. And in fact, it's believed that that algae that grew in the ocean and the water and plankton that was photosynthetic is what allowed the entire world to start using oxygen as the main thing that species breathe and that is so critical for life systems uh, ever from there forward. 
So, the, these Epistos are another one that are going to be okay in low pH water. Um, and that's to say, uh, high acidity, a lower pH number. So let's take a look at these tests. And the first test from this tank here, where we've got the Garamis, which are clearly happy, they're spawning, they've got bubble nests, and they've been having babies for me every couple of weeks. Um, and we can see no nitrates, no nitrites. Look at that bright orange on there. So the bright orange actually indicates that we've got a harder pH than uh, we might expect. And because of that, that means that there's also going to be KH or carbonate hardness, and there's also going to be general hardness that are pretty high, all the way up to 180 there, and uh, somewhere between 40 and 80 on the KH. So this system already has been up and running for three years. It's basically a tank full of grass, full of uh, shrimp in order for these fish to eat, and then it's got barbs and rainbow, uh, rainbow, uh, neon dwarf rainbow <laughs> fish, which is hard to say, praycocks, and then rosy barbs and the garamis. So if you look though in the substrate, and sorry about the reflection, you can see that there is iron in there that has been oxidized in the substrate. And it's actually a, a combination of Amazonia, uh, Amazonia light, Amazonia original, so half and half of that mixed together, and then half, uh, so 50% of ADA Amazonia products, and then half of uh, Fluval stratum, which doesn't have nitrates, nitrites, ammonia, any of the stuff that's going to encourage plant growth. But it's probably all nearing the age of being spent. And so over the years, I've put root tabs as well as iron and sulfur and potassium supplements into this in order to keep the plants growing. Now, we've got a nice minerally tank. And so that is going to give us a buffer to deal with lowering the pH. So when we lower the pH, if we get below 6.0, all of a sudden, the nitrifying bacteria will crash. And in this tank, it's hard to see because it's so full of grass right now, but we have essentially a, a sponge filter and a biomedia uh, reactor filter uh, going in there on an airline. And this tank doesn't have a ton of dissolved oxygen in it anyways with these fish, but we're going to probably move all the fish for this process uh, anyhow, with maybe leaving uh, a couple fish that are uh, tolerant to it, like the garamis, in as a barometer to see how the process is going. But when you boil tannins out of leaves, so if you take leaves or um, you know pods, uh, if you t get almond leaves or husks from coconut trees or coconuts themselves, uh, wood, things like that you basically end up with uh, the tannins being deconstructed and ripped apart and so only some of them survive and then you end up with uh, more decorative botanicals. So they do still have some tannins and they do still leach some and they'll grow all sorts of biofilms but oftentimes what you'll see if you don't boil them first they'll make your entire tank look like tea. So let me get the light on this tank up here. Uh, let me just move this over here and you'll see the difference. So up here we have some truly tannic tanks. However, we used KH and GH buffers to make sure that those tanks were not super acidic for the type of guppies that are in there. So we wanted the tannins and the enzymes of, of the wood particles in there and of plant debris, and we wanted that as a place for them to hide, but we didn't want it to actually lower the pH. So you have to kind of remember that those are actually separate concepts, that the tannins don't automatically lower your pH. It's a, a mis misconception. So when we lower the pH to a 6, as I was saying, we lose the nitrifying bacteria uh, in, in the same way that we have thought of it in the past. And we move over 
to another type of life, which is archaea bacteria or bacteria archaea, however you want to say it. It's its own kingdom of of simple primitive life that's probably been around for a billion years or more. And it found its first life footholds in the vents of the deep ocean as well as uh, just really extreme places like hot springs and sulfuric geysers and so forth. And so when we're talking about all of this, um, these things have evolved side by side. And we only now are kind of figuring out what happens where. But it, what we do know is that these archaea bacteria are very small, very simple. And even compared to the bacteria like nitrifying bacteria, they occur in your tap water, your rain water. They're, they're bacteria, and unless you have sterilized water, you're more than likely going to have them almost anywhere in the world. So you don't need to necessarily infuse your tank with it or anything, but this archaea bacteria is going to break down the nitrates and nitrites as well as their main concern is breaking down the carbon. So any available carbon that's free in the water, that's what's going to feed them. They also, uh, if, if you want to get into things like BSB baskets, um, Dr. Novak is someone you could look into, and he does um, nitri non-nitrifying, uh, basically these baskets that don't use the 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 common way of using um, the bacteria that denitrifies, which uses oxygen-rich environments. Instead, he uses slow-flowing plenums or chambers and another type of bacteria that uses sulfur and iron and carbon to metabolize the uh, ammonia and nitrates out of a system. And then it basically stores them into uh, the substrate or into a container, uh, like a filter container. So you can look into his research too. He's got a whole channel that's very uh, full of info on that. But we don't know for sure, and going over the research for months, years, it turns out that we really don't know in aquariums if we're able to get a true anoxic uh, or anaerobic uh, system. So we don't know if we're getting that to work correctly just in the substrate. But that is what deep substrate systems, so we're talking more than two or three inches, and dense substrate or more than four or five inches with looser substrate like gravel or fluorite, um, that's when you start to get the ability of those other bacteria that aren't the usual suspects that help clean your aquarium and turn uh, the ammonia into safer nitrites nitrates that's where we start seeing the ability to actually fix it into the substrate and then you need plants to remove it and use it to build their own uh, structures their own cell walls and things well when it gets too acidic one the light is hard to penetrate through the tannic water and two, uh, it, it also means that the plants don't want to grow. So that's why we're looking for that sweet spot of just above 5.8, 6.0. 6.0, they say, is really the, the safe cutoff where you can still get some plants. You can definitely get floating plants and you can definitely get things like ferns or immersed growth with vines and hydrocotyl, pennywort, moneywort, things like that, bacopa um, and anubias. And it can actually remove the nitrites, the ammonia that fish create. It can remove that out of the water. Now, if we go below that, then you have to completely rely on water changes. And that may not seem like a big deal, but what you have to remember is when you do a water change, then you're totally changing the chemistry of the water when you put new water in that's not acidic. So you need to have something like a bucket ready brewing with, with the same acidity um, 
that you're going to put into your tank of aged water ready for your water changes uh, if you're going to be doing that that's the best way to do it so most people don't want to deal with that and so they want to set up a system that self-regulates and so that's the idea of what i've been talking about here and we're going to remove all these plants that are floating that are in this tank with this 7.4 7.5 ph and we're going to start to bring that ph down now the other thing though that we saw was that the hardness was actually pretty substantial when we look at the other tanks let's take a look at all these tests together and pardon the mess of all the the tools and things around here but all these tanks are dealing with no uh no serious or no visible nitrates or nitrites so they're all balanced and cycled but if you see here the one that we're going to turn has a lot of i mean so it, it's got more uh more alkaline traits because these colors are darker the general hardness and the carbonate hardness the kh the gh these ones are lighter that means there's less and up here this is lighter so that means that the the acidity or the pH is, uh, you know, these are actually closer to a black water tank. And that makes sense because we saw the tannins, uh, you know, we've got husks in there, we've got pods in there, we're doing lots of water changes, it's aerated, and there's lots of filter media. So we're still using those nitrifying bacteria that can survive. But if we really want to bring it down, we want to have the tank buffered because the KH and the GH, these two on the bottom here, are needed for the tank not to swing wildly um, when we do water changes or when something changes. So those will act as buffers and uh, they will be able to lend or um, either lend ions or take ions as needed basically and kind of give the system some flex from being so um, abrasive to, to the fish in it. So we're gonna remove everything out of here. And in the second part of this video, you'll see that I've removed the, the bulk of these plants. Now, uh, we may have some plants that are growing out and above. So we're gonna have a light that's suspended above a little bit. And we may let the water level drop a bit here. But we're going to stick with the aeration of this filter. Now, one little quirk that you may have noticed is that a lot of times in these uh, really acidic conditions, you have fish like uh, bettas, garamis, and uh, you know different species that are known to be air breathers that are labyrinth fish. And up in here, we've got some natural. Uh, wild bettas um, hanging out and they can easily come into this tank when it's ready uh, but they're in very neutral water up here and you can see the moss doesn't really like the water being slightly acidic to neutral there's not much buffer there's not much substrate so in this tank though we're going to try to add some sand substrate to the already three inches of old soil substrate which is near spent uh, if you were to talk about a cycled aquarium and we're going to add probably two inches of sand to everything and then that means that the substrate itself if it's possible will have the anoxic bacteria working in the in the low low or zero dissolved energy or uh, oxygen environment that is the substrate then the plants can take those nitrates and work with them and we'll have to plant below the sand level uh, the sand is really a trap and a barrier to stop the the ground from off gassing now the only side effect to come from that is going to be methane gas which if you've been in a swamp or a marsh, you'll see a lot of times the water is bubbling or there are releases of bubbles of sulfur and methane. A lot of times people are afraid of that in their other aquarium tanks. So what I want to tell you before we, uh, before we end this episode and we'll pick up on the next episode uh, is that now you've kind of got the fundamentals of what we're talking about when we're talking about low low pH environments where the fish are 
still safe from the buildup of ammonia because as things break down they're going to make acids and it was thought for a very long time that humic acids or basically um, tannins and earth soil uh, plants breaking down was the source of how we got such a low ph however in the 1970s and 80s biologists in both borneo and the Amazon began to find places with pHs as low as 3, 2.8, 3.4, 2.9, you know, these crazy low, like, you know, almost battery acid type con conditions. And yet there were still 10, 15, 20 species of fish living there. And not all of them were just breathing air. So they were able to filter it through their gills and deal with it. Whereas uh, these fish are capable of taking gulps of air and um, breathing that way. Same with like Chana snakeheads and things like um, bettas uh, or other garamis. And that really helps them deal with the transition of if there is an area that's got a lot of silt or mud or debris that's biological and it is harmfully acidic and it would burn their gills normally they're able to breathe that air with their either their labyrinth organ or some catfish and things actually just breathe it right into their stomach and it absorbs through their stomach lining so that's how they can get through those those transitional zones that are so dangerous. And those are good fish to put in these tanks if you're new to this. However, once we get this thing balanced, we can then put in things like rasboras and smaller fish, um, barbs and uh, little catfish and things that are happy in that water that is low pH. So let's look at a deep substrate tank uh, and talk about the biggest secret of all to this that we're just now learning about. All right, so here's a tank that's got a deep, deep substrate. And I tried to use the, policy, the, the thought process of doing deep substrate plenums, layers of sand to cap the layers, of sediment that settle over the years um, that are organic material that breaks down into acidic materials, things like tannins, leaves, um, and fish waste. And then the water that slowly cycles through here actually is serviced by the substrate. And you can see there's layers. Hi guys, you can see my reflection. You can see that there are layers of um, photosynthetic bacteria or cyanobacteria and you know that's in our tap water uh, you can also see that there are algaes and things that are growing in the tank and so all these things happen to just be inoculated in our water and floating around or on our plants so you don't need to do anything special or buy any kits necessarily to get this going it just takes some patience now plant roots bring oxygen down into the substrate and they need oxygen around them so they frequently are going to kind of disrupt that um, anaerobic or anoxic uh, condition where we have low oxygen and we're basically trapping the carbon and the nitrogen down into the substrate and the only thing that's using it are plants um, and if we have water that's too acidic for most plants they're not even going to use it. So we're basically using this as a battery to store the nitrogen, which is basically disassembled ammonia to make it safe. Um, and also to give it to the plants in other forms, like putting it back into the form of ammonia all the way down in lower layers. But that's a complicated process that we won't get into right now. I have other videos on that. But this 9-inch substrate... Um, has worked really well and even without a filter um, the plants have grown really well and the nitrates stay at zero even without doing anything but water top offs so I just wanted to show you that but what we've learned is that despite all this bacteria talk it turns out that the newest research is showing that the leaves 
that are in our tanks and when we do when we look at black water systems they oftentimes get let's see if we can see it over here when we've got new wood in a tank you can see it gets this kind of slimy clear coat on it and that's both bacteria tannins and cellulose coming out and fungi working on it just like if you see fish eggs that turn white and murky that's fungi and there's spores floating all over the water and they're looking for a home. Now, why are they in there? What are they eating? Well, it turns out that it's likely that one of the major causes of the deep, deep acidic black water tanks um, and rivers and ecosystems is actually the fungi working. It is the mushrooms kingdom rather than bacteria or archaea uh, bacteria breaking things down and we honestly just don't know much about it but yet again it's floating in our environment it's impregnated in the wood and just bringing these materials in buying botanicals from good sources where it hasn't been sterilized or boiled or anything will certainly uh, inoculate your tank with all that you need and so we'll talk about that in the next video when you see the first transformation when we've taken out most of the plants in the other tank putting in some some hardy plants that can withstand more acidic water and we're gonna let time take hold and we're gonna get these bacterial processes going so in the meantime if you like this if you're interested in this please uh, let me know what you think share this with your friends or on message boards where you think that they might be interested in it and uh, let's do more research on this we really need to know a lot more about this we're going to be stealing a lot of this anubius and uh, some of this java moss and christmas moss some of this bucephalandra all these things that are found in black water oftentimes they're going to be plants that hopefully uh, we'll be able to keep as well as like the Bacopa monieri um, or Bacopa carolineata uh, or Colorada will be able to grow uh, either immersed or completely submerged in those black water tanks if we're lucky. So tune in next time and uh, Hopefully we can decipher some of this. And if you have any info on the mushrooms, the fungi, they're not truly mushrooms until they fruit, but on the fungi that works to break down all these systems um, and help to cycle just like bacteria does in, uh, in, in our normal aquariums, I would love to do um, reading and dissecting of that literature. But so far there isn't much concrete on how it would function in a uh, system as small as an aquarium. All right, guys, thank you so much, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.